Well, Southwest family, let's go ahead and get to God's word today. If you have your Bibles, meet me in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, as we trek forward ahead in our discipleship pathway, planted, rooted, growing, and going. Uh, While you're turning there, though, and while you're scrolling to that passage, I want to, by way of announcement, talk about two things that are on our hearts as we move forward as a ministry. Uh, The first is in the way of digital online worship. We're making a couple of adaptations that will begin in the middle of July, July 16th and 17th. Uh, Don't worry, online ministry is not going anywhere. If we've learned anything, what we have learned is that the Holy Spirit wants us to continue using this awesome medium of digital ministry to tell people about Jesus Christ. And many of you have been trekking with us faithfully for two years, and I'm so grateful that our community will continue. We're kind of bifurcating the experience. Uh, One experience is not going to change. It's what we have now. It's what we call the Southwest Online Experience. We'll continue to create the access that you currently enjoy, but we'll be archiving these messages and this experience where I'm looking straight into the camera at you on our YouTube channel. Now, the purpose is evangelism. And so the messages will be the same. The passages will be the same. We're going to cater those messages more evangelistically to tell new people about Jesus and about his church, especially the one here in the Coachella Valley Southwest Church. It's our Southwest online experience. But beginning July 16th and 17th, you will also be able to access what we call our Southwest live stream experience. That's me, our one member of our team, preaching live right here at the church with hundreds of people around. It's a different experience where the purpose is connection. This is really for those folks who know Southwest, who go here, who live in the valley. This is your church home. And so we just decided what would it look like for us to be able to bless everyone where they are at? And that's the answer we came up with thus far. Southwest online experience and the Southwest live stream experience. If this is your normal portal for how you connect with the gospel, how you connect Connect with Southwest, don't worry. It's not going anywhere. We're simply adding more to the table as to what we offer for the sake and fame of Jesus Christ. Another announcement that I want to make, and I think we'd just be remiss were we not to just reflect on what I am ready to say is the good news of the United States Supreme Court's decision just the other day. Um, effectually Roe v. Wade and access to abortion has been overturned in our country, which means uh, that there is no longer a federal constitutional right of abortion. Now, those of us who are here in California know that that doesn't really mean anything's changing in California, but across the country, different conservative states are realigning access to abortion. And we think that's good news because lives will be saved. We believe in the sanctity of life and the image of all people from conception all the way to death. And my heart is rejoicing over that. And I know many of your hearts are rejoicing as well. At the same time, this is not time for the church to take off. If anything, in my humble opinion, it's now time more than ever for the church to stand up, to care for mothers, to care for women, to champion adoption, to care for the orphan, Some scholars are saying that abortion really isn't going away. It's just becoming more expensive. And what will it mean for you and I as the Church of Jesus Christ to stand up now more than ever before? My friend Derwin Gray said it best when he said that the pro-life movement and its work is truly actually beginning in this moment. Nonetheless, we rejoice over this good news as we continue to lift up the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I got a lot of fish to fry. I ain't got no time to cook it. But Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, as we continue in our series of going, the call to multiplication. Remember, we've been saying that God's dreaming these dreams over your life. He wants you planted. He wants you rooted. He wants you growing, and he wants you going. In other words, he wants you to go out into the world and make disciples to the glory of his name. And I want to continue some thoughts on that topic. The Christ of heaven. Um, the God-man has been traversing the Galilean landscape. And wherever he goes, he is accompanied by a flurry of miracles. And you can just hear the heralds around Galilee proclaiming this good news. Uh, Storms on seas have been stilled. The eyes of the blind have been opened. The captives have been set free. 
Lives have been turned around. Even the dead have been raised. And as we near the conclusion of Matthew chapter 9, Jesus' only lament is that even though the harvest is plentiful, the problem is that the laborers are few. And as we tiptoe into Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is now recruiting laborers to go and reap the harvest that the Father has provided for his kingdom. Matthew has captured the episode for us and he writes to us these words. Here now, the word of the Lord. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Verse 5, these 12, Jesus, watch this now, sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse lepers, cast out demons, you receive without paying, give without pay, acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for the laborer deserves his food. Whatever town or village you enter, look at verse 11, church, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. I've read from the greatest book ever written. And I bear witness this day, all of its words are true. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter if you're ordinary. Since God is extraordinary, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. You're, you're watching now, and you, you are, you are, you've been hinted that this message is going to be about you being challenged to use your life to pour into other lives the gospel of Jesus and bring them up to maturity in your faith. And maybe you're perplexed as to how you're going to acquiesce to what God has called us to do. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. It doesn't matter if you're ordinary. Since God is extraordinary, ordinary people get to do extraordinary things. I want to tell you guys, uh, if you will, the circuitous story of David and Svea flood. David and Svea flood. Uh, they were missionaries from Sweden who traversed to the land of the Congo in Africa to be missionaries back in 1921 along with their little boy, David. Uh, they're coupled with another team of missionaries, the Erickson family. And here they are being salt and light in the jungles of Africa risking malaria and threat of annihilation and everything else that was the arduous trek that was a missionary's work in the 1920s. Uh, arduous months of sacrifice and toil had only produced just one convert, just one little boy in the village who had given his life to Jesus Christ. And missionaries were downed by this. They were downhearted. They were about to give up. And it's then that one of those couples, the Ericsons, comes to David and Svea to say, we're done. All of this work and only one little boy saved. God has forsaken us. And so we're going to forsake this mission. And they kind of tuck tail and run. And they head to some missionary outpost, leaving David and Svea flood and their little boy all alone. And later on, his wife Svea gets pregnant with their little daughter, Aggie. But tragically, Svea, the wife, dies in this ordeal. David is now all alone with these two kids. He's bitter now. He's hurt now. 
He's ticked off at God now. And he decides that he's going to wash his hands clean of the whole enterprise and leave the mission. He gets the kids. He goes to that missionary outpost where that first couple, the Ericsons, had retreated to. They're getting ready to go back to Sweden. And it's then that David decides his little girl, Aggie, is too young for the trip. He leaves her temporarily with the Ericsons, heads back to Sweden. Months later, the Ericsons themselves suddenly die leaving poor little Aggie left with another missionary couple who take her back to the States where she is raised. Now, fast forward over 40 years later, Aggie, the daughter of David and Svea Flood, is now a grown woman. She's got a family of her own. It's her 25th wedding anniversary, and she and her family go to Sweden to find her long-lost father. She finds him in a little one-room apartment. He is poverty-stricken. He's a stroke victim. He's an alcoholic. And profusely, he is just apologizing that he left his little girl back on that field so many years ago. Of course, she forgives him. And it is then that he unleashes a tirade expressing his bitterness towards God. God left me. All of that work, all of that sacrifice, your mother died and just one little boy convert. I can't understand why God would do this to me. It's then that Aggie, this grown woman now, meeting her father for the first time, says, Papa, I want to tell you a story because I've heard tell now that that little boy grew up and became a soul winner for Jesus. And daddy, did you know that there's over 600 believers in that village today? They have a wonderful reunion and the years pass and it's decades later that Aggie, now an old woman herself, goes to London, England for a great evangelistic conference. And there's this speaker up there who is the superintendent of the National Congolese Church. And he's reporting to this grandiose conference that now in his home of Congo, Africa, there are 110,000 baptized believers. Aggie the daughter of David and Svea Flood, she traverses her way through the crowd and she finds this superintendent. And with tears in her eyes, she begs the question, sir, might you have ever heard of David and Svea Flood? They were my parents. And it is then that tears begin to stream down the superintendent's face as he shares with young Aggie, yes, madam, I know them well, because that's a faithful couple who came to my village. And I was the first little boy to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I'm so sorry that your mother died, but in many ways, because your mother died, my nation now lives. If David Flood were here right now, he would remind us that it doesn't matter if you're ordinary, as long as God is extraordinary. Ordinary people get to do extraordinary things. As we come to our passage, Jesus is traversing through the crowds and he's picking ordinary people. And his plan is this. It doesn't matter if you're ordinary. Stick with me because I'm extraordinary. And I'm the God who makes sure ordinary people can do extraordinary things. I want to talk about what it means to now apply discipleship in our lives. And in so doing, I want to lift up these three distinctives, table of contents for our time. The text teaches us that we are called to discipleship, that we are empowered for discipleship, and it gives us a little, a little inkling as to who we should do discipleship with. I like to tag this text going, the call to multiplication applications. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would, Lord God, miraculously leverage this digital conversation to touch hearts and change lives because God, ours is a world that needs saving. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, Let's just kind of walk through this together, guys. Matthew chapter 10, and I think the big picture that we need to start our conversation off with is this idea that we are called to discipleship. We, we are called to discipleship. You're watching this now. You're driving somewhere. You're at work. You're in the, in the jam right now listening to this on your earbuds. But if you name Jesus Christ as Lord, what I want you to hear more than anything else, friend, is that you have been called to discipleship. I've got good news for you. You do have a purpose. 
you do have a mission for your life, and your mission is this. God wants to use the blessing of Christ that you have in you to translate through you to others. You have been called to discipleship, that call of the gospel to produce reproducing followers of Jesus Christ. That's you. That, that's, that's your destiny. This is what God's plan is to use you to bless the entire world when you make sacrifices and pour what you know about Jesus into the lives of other people so that they are now capable of pouring what they know about Jesus into the lives of others until we reach the entire world. And if you hear nothing else, what I want you to hear today is this. When it comes to discipleship, just hear this. You can do this. You can do this. That's what I want you to hear more than anything else. So we see Jesus picking up a ragtag group of uneducated, uneloquent, unrich um, uh, disciples. It is a reminder that God can use me to. You can do this. We're in Matthew 10, which records the calling of the disciples. And at the same time, it records the commissioning of the 12 disciples. Jesus calls them and then Jesus sends them into gospel ministry. Translation, what was the implication of this? Jesus was saying, gentlemen, you're not going to be bystanders of the gospel. You're not gonna hang out on the sidelines and watch me make disciples. No, I am a God who is incorporating and partnering with all of my creation to be a part of my work in the world. And that's what you need to hear as Jesus calls these disciples. He's also calling us saying, you Christian are not going to be a bystander. You're not going to sit on the sideline and watch other people make disciples, but you, yes, you, God has called into discipleship. Now I've been talking like this for a while to people. One of the things I've noticed over the years is that one of the reasons that it's so hard for people to embrace this and accept this is that they, they hear, I'm called to make disciples. I'm called to the Great Commission. I'm called to share my life with others. Their first reaction tends to be, who, me, right? Like you hear this, go and save the world, right? What's the average reaction from the average Christian? You can't be talking to me. God, God you, you can't be putting that calling on my life, God. There's better Christians out there. God, there's, there's, there's more biblically knowledgeable Christians out there. There, 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 are more, there are more Christians out there who have a collection of Beth Moore bobbleheads that need to be doing that. You can't be meaning me, but I want you to hear it. Your God-ordained purpose is to make disciples. And don't overthink it because all discipleship is, remember this from last time? All discipleship is, is you being just a little ahead in Christ than someone else and you faithfully and sacrificially slowing down so that that person can catch up and you pour your life into theirs in such a way that they now can go and find someone else to catch up to where they are. All discipleship is, is pouring yourself and what you know about Jesus and what you love about Jesus into the life of another. Now, there's two things I think we need to hear because a lot of you watching right now are like, who, me? Like, not, and I don't think God's talking to me about that. Ricky, it seems like it's your job. You paid to do that. But I'm here to tell you that it's all of our jobs. I think the modern church has two things they need to hear. One's hard and one's hopeful. Let's do hard first. The first thing you need to hear is this. The Great Commission is not a choice to consider. It's a commandment to obey. Friend, the point of the Great Commission and Jesus has called to the church to make disciples of all nations, it is not optional. Jesus is not somewhere up in heaven asking us what we think about this. This is his plan A to save the world. There is no plan B. So when you lament everything that's going on in culture right now, okay, California is running out of water now, okay? Access to abortion is not changing in California whatsoever today. Drug trafficking, sex trafficking of minors and children and women. When you think about the political divide, the racial trauma that our land is experiencing, high inflation, I'm here to tell you that God's answer to all of that stuff is for Christians like you and I to empty ourselves into the lives of people in our lives to bring them to maturity in their faith. God's answer to the world is Christian people making disciples. 
And what I want you to hear is that it's not optional. God's not asking us what we think about it. It's not like what happens with my kids, right? I got two boys and a girl, Cam, Grand, and my little girl, Andy. It's like when I go to them all the time, Cam, okay, take out the garbage. Grand, okay, go clean up your, your bed. And then I go to my little girl. I say, Andy, well, I don't, I don't tell my little girl to do hardly anything. It, it, it is what it is. But, but, but it's just funny. Cam, go take out the garbage. And all you hear is, Dad, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. And that's when I come up to him and I hug him and I rub his head. I say, son, I'm so sorry. But I wasn't asking you what you think. I, I, was, I was asking you to do something. Translation, when God says, church, I want you to go make disciples, he's saying, I'm not really asking you what you think. I'm telling you what we have to do in order to make change in the earth. I want you to hear this. The call to discipleship is not like your iPhone. You don't get to look at the phone and see somebody calling and know who it is on the caller ID and make a decision that you're going to hit ignore and talk to them later. God don't work like that. He's calling us right now. And I urge you to answer the call to pour your life into someone else. The second thing I think we need to hear is this, as we come to the text, that if Jesus used these disciples, he sure enough can use us. That's what I want y'all to hear right now. I'm telling you, if you ordinary, if you missing some stuff, if you a few fries short of a happy meal, if you your money is funny and your credit don't get it, I'm here to tell you, you fit and God has says, I can use you too. Because that's what this text is teaching us. Matthew is recording here the list of disciples, right, that Jesus calls into the gospel ministry and one of the things that's most impressive about our passage is how unimpressive these disciples are. When a rabbi would have called disciples, he usually would have called them to discipleship. Somewhere around 12 to 15 years of age, we're pretty confident that the disciples were on the other side of 15. We think most of them are somewhere between 15 and 20, meaning that the disciples themselves would have already been overlooked by other rabbis. So the idea is that Jesus, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, is picking guys who didn't get picked. And that's why I know you can do this too, because if God never changes, and I know he doesn't, that means he's still picking the people, feet other people don't pick. Somebody should have said amen right there. They weren't professional. They were not eloquent. They were not impressive. Can I go further? Some of them weren't even faithful. I mean, look at the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers come for Jesus. The Bible says every last one of the disciples forsook him and fled. Notice the list includes Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. If Jesus could use these guys, I'm a witness. He can use us. Yet these same guys, after the resurrection, go to the known world in the uttermost parts of the earth to share their faith and make disciples so much so that in its first generation of history, the Christian church grew 400 times its size. If God can use them, God can use us. What's my point? You can do this. You can do this. God has a fantastic track record of using ordinary people. And this list shows that Peter always had his foot in his mouth. Thomas was a doubter. James and John were arrogant and had big heads, okay? Simon the zealot, that zealot is cold word for I want to kill someone. Simon the zealot was a wannabe assassin. Matthew was a tax collector, which meant he was a straight up hustler and a thief. Translation, if Jesus can use them, I know he can use you. Now, I know you're hearing this and you're like, yeah, but Rick, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. I don't know any Greek words like you, hadn't been to seminary, and I want to remind you that the average Christian in history has not been a professional, and God has used them, and God can use you. Consider the evidence. The church attending American Christian has more biblical knowledge than 95% of all pastors on planet Earth. All pastors on earth, only 5% of them have a formal training education. If you've been to church at least 10 times, you already know more than most 
pastors to some degree. Secondly, throughout history, the vast majority of Christians have been illiterate. Most Christians in world history could not read or write. If you can read or write, you are already ahead. And my point is this, you can do this. You're a, you're a lawyer with a practice trying to do the right thing, but God told me to tell you, you're also a di disciple maker and you can do this. You're a deputy, you're a police officer, you're a, you're a first responder. There's a young guy that you work with that you think may have some potential. God told me to tell you, you're also a disciple maker and you can do this. You're a single mom and you're just trying to eke it out and get these kids raised up right. But, but God told me to tell you, they're also an audience for the gospel. You're also a disciple maker and you can do this. You're a 20 year old watching this right now. You're just trying to figure out what am I gonna do with my career? What am I gonna do about college? What am I gonna do about money? But God told me to tell you wherever he lands you, that wherever he lands you also has a purpose. You're also a disciple maker and you can do this. And you're watching this, but you're like, Ricky, how? Well, here's the good news of the text. It's because God has given you power for discipleship. You are empowered for discipleship. Can I preach real quick, y'all? God has power to help you make disciples. The God who rescued Daniel out of the lion's den is going to help you. The God who parted the Red Sea is going to help you. The God who defeated the 400 prophets on Mount Carmel is going to help you. The God who got Lazarus up out of the grave is going to help you. The God who raised up Jesus three days later is going to help you. God doesn't get to call you to something and doesn't also get to not empower you for something. If God called you, God will empower you. That's the good news for us as we consider this calling. Notice the text, verse 1. The Bible says Jesus gave them authority. It's the Greek word exousia. Exousia was not just the, the right to do something. It was coupled with the ability to do it. So it's a, full, it's a full word here. Jesus is saying, I'm not just giving you the right guys to go out and be salt and light. I'm giving you the power to do it. So in our passage, it's not just Jesus sending them, but exousia. It's also Jesus empowering them to proclaim, powering them to witness, empowering them to heal and deliver and set free. So if you're watching this and you're doubting how you're going to make it, how are you going to make disciples? I want you to know that the moment you put your trust and faith in Jesus, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, came to make his abode in your heart. And this is what you need to hear. The Spirit was given to each of us so that the gospel might be spread through all of us. Discipleship is way more about who God is than who you are. And as long as you got God on your side, you can make disciples, okay? Who is God? Well, Psalm 19 declares that he is the creator. Psalm 19 says that, that, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies above proclaim the work of his hands. If God can create the universe, God can help you make disciples. Uh, there's a star in space called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. There's a star in space, in space called Betelgeuse. Get this. Betelgeuse is 527 light years from Earth. Let me put that in the real numbers. Betelgeuse is three quadrillion, 91 trillion, 969 billion, 402 million, 76,285 miles away. How big is it? How big is it? Well, the Earth's orbit around the sun is 583 million miles. That's how expansive the Earth's sun or orbit is around the sun, 583 million miles. Betelgeuse is twice the size of that orbit. It's over then a th one billion, is that right? 5,580, no, one, anyway, 583 times two, whatever that number is. That's how big Betelgeuse is. Betelgeuse is just one star amongst 400 billion stars in our galaxy, all of which have an average distance of 29 trillion miles from each other. If we keep taking that out, we think there's an additional 200 billion galaxies in the universe. And my point is this, my God made it all when he said, let there be light. 
And you say to me, Ricky, what about the Big Bang Theory? I espouse to the Big Bang Theory. My God is big, and one day he said, bang. And my point is this. The same God who had the power to make Beetlejuice is the same God who has power to help you make disciples. God will give you the power. You're called to discipleship. You're empowered for discipleship. But now as you're thinking about how to apply this in your life, who do you do discipleship with? I want to encourage you from this moment on as you think about what it means to pour your life into another life. Literally start asking God to send you a fat person. <laughs> Ask God to send you somebody fat. Now, some of y'all are already thinking, Lord, do you want me to disciple Ricky? It's not what I'm saying. The text seems to suggest that as Jesus sends the 12 out on mission, verse 11, he says, find someone who is worthy. Now, what does it mean to be worthy, to hear the gospel and be brought up in the gospel? It can't mean merit-based. It can't be performance-based because then it would no longer be the gospel. All worthy in our text means is anybody willing to listen and consider receiving Jesus. That's what it means to disciple. You're looking for a worthy person. Some of you watching today have a worthy child that's ready for you to pour into them. Some of you have a worthy neighbor who's ready for you to pour into them. Some of you have a worthy coworker that's ready. Some of you have a worthy person at your church that's ready for you to pour into them. And my question to you is, will you pour into them? You're just looking for a fat person. Fat, it just means this. Look at it on the screen. It means you're faithful, you're available, and you're teachable. Not brilliant, not got it all figured out, not impressive. All the disciples needed for Jesus to call them into ministry was for them to be faithful, available, and teachable. As we close, you're watching this, and maybe you have, like me, the lament of what's going on in the world that is around us, and you're worried about it, and there's trepidation, and you don't know what the future looks like. Well, the answer for the church has always been to go into that world and pour into lives because just one investment in just one life can make a world of difference. And don't let ordinariness stop you because it didn't stop the disciples and it shouldn't stop you either because it doesn't matter if you're ordinary. Since God is extraordinary, ordinary people get to do extraordinary things. God wants you planted. God wants you rooted. God wants you growing. But friend, don't forget the last and thereby the most important step. God wants you going multiplying yourself in the lives of others that the world might be reached for the cause of Christ. Father, I thank you, God, for your word and its truths. And I pray in Jesus' name with this message, Lord, Father God, would truly be taken to heart and be applied in our lives. Give us gumption and encourage Jesus to begin even now praying for that fat person in our world that we can invest in and pour into, Lord, till you come. I pray this in Jesus' name. And until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We'll see you next time.